Welcome back to Behind the Bastards, legally the only podcast. Um, we've we've achieved our domination of uh, global media, and it is now a felony to operate any other podcast on the internet. So suck on you know. that, losers. Yeah, we imperialized podcasts. Hold on, let me just hey, catch catch this. I'm about to throw pod. you a diamond through the iPad. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's our flex. <laughs> I also just ate some potatoes. I apologize. He also just ate some potatoes. Mm-hmm. He apologizes. Prop. Yes. How are you still doing? How are you feeling hey. after part one? Cecil uh, Rhodes. You know, yeah, I feel the <laughs> way I think everyone, every guest feels after slightly defeated, feeling like mm-hmm. I knew this, but I didn't know it. And my day is great because i enjoy talking to y'all but yeah dog. but also like yeah, the feeling nice. between part one and part two of every episode of this podcast you just know that it's gonna get worse it's only getting worse yeah, yeah you're just like impending you doom. guys got a two-day break to yeah process. impending doom but yeah, also some, i'm still thinking yeah. about him flashing his diamonds at parties just the the flex of that, like I can't get that image out of my head Absolutely and how not. I feel about it. Mm-hmm. It's so hard to process how I feel about that because it's he mm-hmm. sucks, but it's so fucking cool. But like, yeah, touche, you gotta homie. respect the hustle sometimes. Gotta you know? respect it. Like, goddamn. Okay, yeah. So, uh, in that last episode, I didn't go into overwhelming detail about all of the Cape Colony politicking that Cecil engaged in, but he was not just building a business, going to Oxford, you know, getting to know people within sort of the empire's political strata. A lot of his friends would be very influential. Um, the, the parties that they would go to when he was back, you know, home in, in, in England were often held at like a Nancy Astor's house, Miss Astor, who was like this, this very fancy she was a very big figure in sort of like the the Victorian era uh, uh, of British high society uh, okay. and later became a backer of the Nazis. If you've ever heard that that story about like Winston Churchill, where like some lady walks up to him and says, um, you, sir, are drunk. Is that what yeah, you uh, No, No, it's the um, uh, if I if she was like, if, if you were my husband, I would do something that or one. other. And he says, yeah. like, or, yeah, I'd kill you. And if I were if you were my husband, I'd, if you were my wife, I'd let you. I'd um, let I you. Yeah, is, is more or less how it goes. Yeah. So she's like one of his confidants when she's younger. Like a lot of people who go on to run the empire um, are friends of Cecil's in in his younger life. So he's politicking okay. with that set of people. And by the way, a decent chunk of them wind up backing the Nazis and you know the whole World War II period. Um, and uh, but back in the Cape Colony, he's also he's getting very directly involved in politics. He's not mm-hmm. just meeting people. He's he's getting he's into he, he gets he's getting elected to parliament. He's like he's he's doing politics in the Cape Colony. And he becomes very, very successful at it. He's very good at being a politician. Um, So, yeah, that's that's happening during this whole period that we were talking about last episode. Mm -hmm. Um, One of his very first political forays happened in 1883 when he was a member of the Cape Parliament. Boers from the Transvaal had conquered some of the land of an African chief named Mankarwane, uh, and they proclaimed their conquest to be a new republic, Stella Land. Now, they were not the only white guys out there who were, like, creating countries via machine gun. Another group of Boers uh, conquered and declared a republic nearby a few months earlier. So, like, this was happening a number of times. And Cecil hated it. Not because it was wrong for them to steal the land of African tribes, but because all these new republics disturbed his dream of a South Africa united under the English colors. Or under British colors, whatever. Yeah. Um, and the founder, Rotberg, writes, I sol- this is his speech to the parliament. I solemnly warn this house that if it departs from the control of the interior, we shall fall from the position of the paramount state in South Africa, which is our right in every scheme of federal union in the future to that of a minor state. What we now want, Rhodes urged his colleagues in a memorable phrase, is to annex land, not natives. That's, that's a key phrase. That right? is... Yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Rhodes made it clear that he was, quote, no Negro Philist. <laughs> that, <laughs> like, that is a word because people accused him because he wasn't like overtly physically cruel to his workers. Yeah. He was accused of being a Negro file. That was a term wow. they used. That was yeah. like a word a that Negro you like. A Negro file. Yeah. yeah. I am 
<laughs> and here he's defending himself by saying, I'm not a Negrophilist, and I hold the distinct view that we must extend our civilization beyond our present borders. And we don't need any of them on the land that they currently own. We just need the land. Dang. Um, hey, guys. And he, I don't yeah. want your wallets. I, I, don't, I, don't want, I don't want your... I just want the land, bro. Mm-hmm. Dang. Yeah. Now, he urged the parliament to basically carry out a military action against the whites of Stella Land, the Boers, who had, who had usurped Mankarwani's land. But mm. he didn't want to give the land back. Uh, and he wrote, or he, sp- he said, the natives are bound gradually to come under the control of the Europeans, I feel. Uh, that it is the duty of this colony then, as it were, her younger and more fiery sons go out and take land to follow in the, their steps with civilized government. That's the purpose of fiery young men is to go out wow. and take land. Yeah. I, I still, you know, that's part of like my history that's unclear is like, you know, I knew those British colonies, I knew those Dutch colonies, but it ended up, the Dutch end up getting it. I just don't know how that happened. This is, is actually a lot of time? that story. Yeah. This oh, okay. Is a- yeah. So the first, first Boer War happens, I think, not that long after he comes to Africa in the first place. And it's pretty small. Mm-hmm. I think like three, 400 people die. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is fighting. Off yeah. and on, kind of between the British and between the Boers. Yeah. Um, and they're both really shitty to the natives, I should totally. say. Like, this isn't a good guy, bad guy thing. No, you're fighting over a yeah. house that ain't yours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I yeah. stole it fair and square. Yeah. Yeah. In this instance, like, he failed. Like, he, he urged the, the Cape Colony to basically, like, send out a military force to attack these new republics. And he did not succeed in that. Um, the 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 government of the empire, for one thing, was like, we don't really want to get involved in this. We already have enough land down there. Like, And that's one of the things you see. Cecil wants more land than the people actually running the British Empire want it to have because he's getting it too fast. He's acquiring it too quickly. And they're like, mm-hmm. we can't like we can't digest all of this. It's yeah. actually kind of a strain on our resources to try to govern it. Yeah. His his attempt to take both these republics by force fails, but the treaty that comes as a result of this between the empire and the Transvaal gives Britain responsibility for a vast chunk of land north of the Cape Colony. Uh a lot of what would become Zimbabwe. Okay. Um and this is obviously land that they get responsibility for in this treaty that other people live in and are governing <laughs> themselves in at the time. So we're, yeah. we're, we're already a country, guys. I don't yeah. understand what's happening. Yeah. yeah. In 1890, Cecil was elected prime minister of the Cape Colony. So at this point, he's like he is he is Dang. the power in in southern Africa. Uh, he controls the most po- powerful political entity in the region. Um and he also is, again, personal owner of most of the world's diamonds. Oh uh, so he's hit his zenith here. After almost 20 years of methodically building power, Rhodes is is ready to launch his first major attempt to unite Southern Africa, which is, of course, a precursor to taking all of Africa for the yeah. British Empire. So in 1890, he forms the British South Africa Company, which is a, an, an umbrella business that he uses to coordinate all of his enterprises. He's one of the first guys to start setting up shell companies. Um, mm. Some of what he does is to like make fake false competition over diamonds to like drive up the um, the price of diamonds okay. it also is what he does if you think back to our wonga coup episode or anything on 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 eric prince uh-huh. he uses this company to buy a mercenary army um yeah uh and i i, I want to read a quote from a book called the heartless stone which is about the diamond trade by tom zollner Quote, by Rhodes's own admission, the company aimed to do more than mine diamonds. In fact, it aimed to annex other African nations, conduct diplomacy with local chiefs, build mm. railroads, raise a standing army, and even wage war. De Beers was a law to itself and accountable to no one. So again, the South a- British South Africa Company and De Beers, essentially the same thing in this period because they're run by the same guy. It's just, it's a shell company, you know? It's, it's, it's yeah. It, yeah. It's so crazy too, like, to just like, you know why we talked in the first episode about this like like these people live on another planet and in that planet it's like controlling all of the money and resources ain't enough you still got to become prime minister do you know what i'm saying like that you st- like why how was you in college then you ain't got to be in college you know with pocket diamonds yeah what else do you expect though from pocket diamonds guy this is this seems on par yeah. it's, it's very that's what i'm on saying par. like that is the we know like that is the on that is the next step is you yeah. want to get in political power it's like why like do you it's you never good. enough it's, it's never, never enough. ever enough never enough yeah. um now here's the thing so he uh this this period of time like the 1890s it's not 
popular or appropriate anymore for a corporation to have an army in the traditional sense of the word, because the British East India Company has kind of run into some, a lot of that ended uh, very ugly in Afghanistan and in, in chunks of India. Um, mm-hmm. So, but he, he buys an army. He just calls them police. Um, <laughs> so he gets about a 700 man army with machine guns, field artillery. It is an army, but he calls them police and he puts together a group of 200 settlers and he sends them into a place called Mashona land, which is roughly present day Zimbabwe in order uh-huh. to search for gold. And he sends his army in not to invade Mashona land, but to protect the settlers because that's what police do is they protect Oh, man. <laughs> it's, just, it's just nothing new, man. It's yeah. just nothing new. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of new then, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now we're just going to protect um, you. Yeah. Word? We're just here to protect, to serve and protect you, not them. So... <laughs> They picked Mashona land because it was much more weakly defended than its neighbor to the south, uh, Matabele land, mm-hmm. uh, which was governed by a king named Lobengula, who they, to whom the people in Mashona land owed fealty. So they were part of Lobengula's kind of empire, but this is not really a country in the traditional sense of the term. It's yeah. systems of influence between different groups of tribes that are mostly autonomous, but like the Mashona will pay tribute to Lobengula and he's, yeah, mm-hmm. like, anyway, it's, a, it's, it's, yeah. Um, so Rhodes and Great Britain successfully negotiated a treaty with Lobengula, which guaranteed them mineral rights to the territory. And this is going on for a couple of years before he becomes prime minister. Okay. Um, and the, the way that the treaty is negotiated becomes a problem for Rhodes because it's only mineral rights. And his real ambition is to found a new country, which he doesn't have the right to do. But he plays along for the sake of legal nicety. Okay. And if you've paid attention to anything written accurately about colonialism, you know what a treaty between white people and natives means. <laughs> yeah. 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 So they're placeholders. The col- they're placeholders <laughs> yeah. for guns. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Except for, I guess recently we did make good. The Supreme Court made us make good on exactly one of the treaties we made with the Native Americans here in the United States, which is why like half of Oklahoma is now not under federal law enforcement jurisdiction or something. I don't fully understand the situation, but it's something like that. Like there was a treaty that they signed and they were like, look, we have this. And the Supreme Court had to be like, yeah, we have to actually take this seriously now. We have to do this. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So good on Oklahoma. Um, All right. So. Yeah, half of it at least. So yeah. the colonists quickly established a capital, uh, Salisbury, um, and they found, or Salisbury, whatever, and they found the land to be fertile, but they gradually realized there was no gold there, which was a problem, again, because they don't have rights to anything else, only the minerals. Um, and it meant that because there wasn't gold, his company is burning through De Beers' capital without anything to make up for the losses. And by the first Uh-oh. year, they're out by 700,000 pounds. So they start taking austerity measures. He has to cut most of the police force and show shutters a lot of the administrative functions, which he shouldn't have been doing anyway, because this isn't allowed to be a country, but he's, he's, <laughs> he's treating it as one. Yeah. Um, which were unnecessary in the first place, but yeah. go on. Yeah. So everything that comes next is very complicated, which is often the case when the Britain acquired chunks of Africa. It's, it's not often, it, less often is it just naked force invading than it is a series of much more limited military engagements and then extensive treaties and then settlements mm. come in and then there's a fight and then there's a military engagement and more and, and they just keep eating more and more and Mm. that's kind of what happens here um naked force is always a part of it but there's also a lot of political maneuvering and negotiation to make the rank theft of land seem legal because the british are like a law loving people they want to believe that they're they're going about this properly yeah um the short of it all is that king lobengula basically sold all of the land rights that he had to a, a Boer named Lippert as part of a complex ploy to try to play the Boers against the British because he can't think of any other way to fight them. And this doesn't work out. It backfires because none of the white people that Lobengula was negotiating with gave a shit about abiding by their words. So Lippert sold the claim to Rhodes, who starts selling land occupied by the Mashona to white settlers and then pocketing the profit for De Beers. The indigenous peoples a- a- uh, obviously got nothing. Yeah. Um, so in 1893, this leads to an invasion of Mashona land by King Lobengula. And his justification is that they'd stopped paying him tribute because the white guys had take, uh, taken over. So yeah. Rhodes uses this invasion as a justification to just kind of take everything. Um, and the battles that followed were all 
absolute nightmare. So he 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 sends in actual British regular forces to help fight alongside his police forces. And they're Sheesh. you know these are armies of uh, modern armies with machine guns and field artillery uh, going up against African armies with at best kind of antique rifles. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it's just a nightmare. All of these battles at the battle of they're not even really battles at, at the battle of Ego Dodd, for example. Um, six thousand African soldiers attacked a column of several hundred whites in ten minutes. 800 Africans were dead and three Englishmen were killed. Good Lord. Um, And even these profoundly racist colonial soldiers were shocked by the bravery of African warriors charging these machine gun lines in the way that British soldiers would be doing a couple of decades later during World War I. Um, One of these... Uh, soldiers later wrote, it was a nasty 10 minutes, especially as the Matabale shooting with the rifles was much better than it had been. And they came on with wonderful courage to within 80 yards of the wagons because all the fighting, they're building wagon circles yeah. and just shooting out. It made one realize what ter- what those terrible machine guns mean. It must have required extraordinary courage to come up the hill against the fire. And again, one of the things that's interesting here is if you if you read about Western soldiers in this, they there's always there's kind of in in, in statements like this, you can read this dawning realization that like we'll be running into those machine guns one of these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you can't, yeah, you can't work in that field and not know yeah. someone's. There's always a bigger gun. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, which I'm sure I know a lot of U.S. soldiers who have been in Afghanistan and Iraq know about yeah. drones. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So uh, the Times correspondent who was embedded with the British forces also hailed the gallantry of the men he'd just seen die. Quote, as showing their tenacity, I may mention that many were found 3,000 yards away from the spot where they had received their death wound. Um mm. But, you know, toughness, courage, it doesn't really matter when the other side has machine The end guns. of the day. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, they had the Maxim gun, you know, that's what happened. <sighs> Whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun and they have not. Yeah. So after several bloody defeats, Lobengula eventually fled north with most of his remaining soldiers. And I think he killed himself, um, you know, poisoned himself. There's some debate about that uh, from uh-huh. what I can read. And of course, now that all of this land has been conquered, white settlers flood into the areas. Uh, they decide early that the original African names of these places were not going to do, um, Starting in 1891, uh, the name Rhodesia grew increasingly popular. And mm-hmm. Cecil encouraged this, as there's evidence it had been his plan for sometimes for years before the invasion to name both of these new illegally conquered nations after himself. By 1895, the term was in regular use, and in 1897, it became official. So there's oh two gosh. Rhodesias, actually. There's Northern Rhodesia and Southern Rhodesia, and both become the personal property of Cecil Rhodes. Um, <sighs> when asked about this, he told a friend, well, you know, to have a bit of country named after one is one of the things a man might be proud of. You you know what, bro? I don't like, fuck with you. Yeah. Yeah. That's his pocket diamonds. Now he's got pocket Rhodesias. Now he's got... Oh, yeah. God. And I think he is the only person in, in history who has ever personally owned two countries named after him. Uh, you Look... Not in his yep. honor. It's not named after his in his honor. Yeah. It's is mine. And I is mm-hmm. is his and he and he named it. Mm-hmm. Good Lord. I can't. Oh man. Mm-hmm. The I just Lord. Yep. Give me the confidence and just success of mediocre white guys. Yep. If I could just be as wow, that man anyway. Naked confidence. Naked all it takes. confidence. And yeah. Reckless ambition. Yeah. Good stuff. Who says you can't? Yeah. You like, what do you tell that guy? What do you tell that guy? I mean, you can't. Bro, like, what if you, what if you were in seventh grade? Who with says him? you can't? Yeah. Would it be? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Who what says you were, I can't? Yeah. What if you were in seventh grade with him and you're just like, and he like beat you in like freaking kickball and you're like, I just, I just don't, I just want this guy to lose. And then you run into him at like a pub in London. He's got two countries. Yeah. And you're just like, God. Ah, and you're such a piece of shit. Yeah. God dang. So, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. he, as racists like to point out, because again, this guy's beloved by racists. Uh, of course. He did, Rhodes did a lot of lovely things to to connect and modernize Africa. He had telegraph uh-huh. cables laid from Cape Town to Cairo. He had train tracks mm-hmm. laid across the continent. There's a, the most famous 
uh, il- illustration of him is a political cartoon that you've almost certainly seen where he's he's standing as like a giant caricature of him is standing in the center of the continent of Africa with like mm-hmm. telegraph cables across him and it's called the new colossus of roads um wow. and yeah that's like that that's his his reputation in this period of time uh-huh. um yeah and and he's doing this he's putting all this together to connect the continent because connecting it will prepare it for british control and prepare of it course. to have a unified culture under the anglo-saxon race which is what he wants for africa and everywhere that's not africa mm-hmm. um so he conquers other peoples uh, including the matabele people um and he, yeah, it's it's uh it's it's horrible. He he killed, he he's doing a lot of conquering, uh, and he's he's in the field for a significant amount of this. He's not like fighting, but he's following his armies along. He's in a tent. He loves doing this. He loves being on the ground and being sort of a, feeling the dust in his lungs and being a part of it. Um, he's a sick so fuck while all this is was what he is, yeah, yeah, he yeah. Is. It's 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 the same as like those people who like sat up on a hill to watch the battles in the Civil War, you know? Yeah, um, yeah except yeah. for he wants to be directing that shit and he yeah. doesn't want there to be a chance that the people fighting back will win no it's a, no it's yeah. a movie yeah so while all this is going on the mighty de beers company was still chugging right along cecil had gained almost complete control over the diamonds uh, planet's diamond supply so quickly and improved production so much that he ran into a problem there were too many diamonds it turned out that the little bastards are actually pretty common. In order to avoid a collapse in the value of the mineral that was funding his illegal wars of expansion, Cecil hatched a scheme. Uh, so he starts laying off thousands and thousands of his workers, and he creates a bunch of policies that inflated the price of diamonds, that restricted the supply artificially. He's one of the first guys. He creates artificial scarcity. I shouldn't say he's one of the first guys, because we talk artificial about in our scary. Birth of Capitalism episode – the yeah. first corporation that ever existed traveled to the Spice Islands, committed genocide, and then killed all of the nutmeg on every island but the one that they had their farms on in order to That's keep the it East scarce India. and valuable. That's yeah, the East uh, India Trading Co. Is that, this, is that what this was? is the Dutch, the Dutch East um, India Company, I think it was. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, so yeah. This is before even that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I may Damn. be a little – you listen to the episode. I get it right yeah. there. Um, <laughs> Word. But yeah, uh, so he, he creates artificial scarcity for the diamond – uh, for diamonds because he realizes that's the only way to make diamonds profitable. And this doubles the price of diamonds in a single year. Mm. Um, so he channels, he restricts the supply, he channels the diamonds uh, into a bunch of different diamond dealers in London uh, who are willing to make a cartel with him. He basically, he creates a cartel with the people make digging the diamonds and like the people selling them and crafting them in order mm-hmm. to keep prices high. Um, and the diamond industry continues to work this day into like, the fucking elite, like, like honestly, in some ways to the present day, but it doesn't really start to get broken up until the middle of last century. Okay. Um, yeah. So <sighs> in 1894, Rhodes was elected prime minister a second time. He was 41 years old, the owner of two private nations, one of the wealthiest men in history, the sole proprietor of the diamond trade, and the elected leader of the most powerful colony in South Africa. Yeah, that's my question. Which was almost as big as Europe. Yeah. So he's the prime minister of South Africa, quote unquote, or the a yeah. colony in South well, Africa. The, the Cape Colony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Cape Colony. He's the prime minister yeah. of the Cape Colony, like duly elected according to whatever made up laws they have at the same time the owner of other comp- countries yeah not other companies other countries so you the mm-hmm. prime minister of one and own two other god dog. he's a greedy bastard mm-hmm. he is mm-hmm. and i see how he's like the Atta turk of yeah bastard yeah. like yeah he's here there's no there's i don't know we've reached we've reached pinnacle bastard yeah, peak bastard here. Peak He's, bastard. It, it doesn't. It doesn't get. It doesn't get much worse than this a guy like Cecil bastard. Rhodes. This is a. Yeah. I'm like I. I grossly like said, under asked, underestimated He's, this guy. Sure. He's fucking Hitler level, you know. If you're yeah. talking about like the most influential pieces of shit in history, he's there's not. He's on the list. There's yeah. a number of folks at his level. There's not a lot of people I'd put above him. Clearly, I don't know if you could put um, that. Yeah, not nah, it's yeah, yeah yeah you can. Yeah. Hitler a lot of ties no for the top of that list. Yeah. 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 Hillary ain't own no so, country now. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know what isn't the sole proprietor of two countries illegally conquered by a mercenary police force? The products and services that support That's this right. here podcast. That's right. None of them. 
None, None of, them. of them. Until I conquer my own country in present day Idaho um, and use it as a basis from which to declare war on the FDA. Hmm. That's the plan. I wouldn't mind you redeeming Idaho. Yeah. It's pretty beautiful we can do up it. there. Together, we can harness the power of Idaho to wipe out the FDA. I think, actually, I would have a lot of support in Idaho for taking on the FDA, mostly from people who want to sell brain pills. But anyway, yeah. um, we could probably ally with Utah. Anyway, here's the ads. <laughs> We're back. We're back and we're talking about Cecil. So he gets elected prime minister for the second time. And yep. now that he's at the height of his power, he's really got everything under control. He's just gotten his second election. He turns to the thing that has maybe been- Are we at the part in the episode been... where you're like, here it is, you're at the top of the roller coaster and he's about to just like- Nope. nope. Nosedive. We haven't nosedive we're at the yet? Part, we're at the part where he invents apartheid. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So he decides that the focus of his second term as prime minister is going to be dealing with what he called the native question. Now, oh, you white man, motherfucker. If you know fascists, you know that when people have a question about a race that they keep referring to as the blank question, it doesn't end well. (laughs) Ever. (laughs) Oh, man. Oh, my Uh, gosh. The trajectory is predictable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, So, from the founder, quote, that biography Mm. of Rhodes. Rhodes employed this skillfully obtained, unprecedented, and largely unquestioned measure of decisive political power to continue rearranging relations between blacks and whites. He had introduced radical notions in this domain during the legislative years from 1890 to 1892. From 1893, and dramatically after his electoral triumph in 1894, much of Rhodes's considerable political energy was directed at to rewriting the Cape statute books in ways which might have appeared limited and parochial at the time, but which were profoundly to alter the contours and reach of discrimination throughout South and even Southern Africa. He viewed burgeoning African numbers as a clear danger to white superiority and to the emerging coalition of Dutch and English speaking colonialists. Together, Rhodes and his allies acted to undercut the established tradition of Cape liberalism. That's what I was talking about earlier, the liberalism, the idea that all men are equal and we have to, even if we all don't really believe it, we have to hold to that because it's important. Um, Even the most antagonistic of the Cape's legislators and the most diehard leaders of the bond, which is one of the political sort of factions there, had hitherto been hesitant to erode the principle that all persons, irrespective of color, were equal before the law, one of Britain's priceless 19th century gifts to the Cape and thus to South Africa. During Rhodes's premiership, however, other more expedient objectives achieved precedence. Yeah, man. When I think about like this, it's like, it's hard to not picture Jim Crow and be like, oh, this is if you carry Jim Crow out to its logical conclusions. Yeah. And then leave it until the 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. At, yeah. Yeah. At, oh, gosh. Yeah, dude. Yeah. And, and that, and, and it's like, you go, when he, yeah, the question, the native question, it's like, of, of course, this is what you're going to come up with. Of course yeah. it is. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Keep reading, Robert. So, um, yeah, he uh, his main objective here is white supremacy. Um, yes. and, and again, white supremacy in a very modern way. Uh, and the best thing that illustrates his drive to white supremacy and everything that like uh, how his thought process worked and the way in which he took action to to further that goal. The best thing that illustrates that is Rhodes's plan to push through the passage of what was called the Glyn Gray Act. Now, Glyn Gray was a district in the Cape Colony that had essentially been a reservation for for one group of, of African natives. Mm-hmm. Quote, like most reservations, Glen Gray was overcrowded and overgrazed. Many of its male inhabitants had already begun to seek work from whites in the colony. Others, meanwhile, had crowded into Glen Gray from more distant or less settled frontier areas. Whites, especially Dutch-seeking farmers, coveted its fertile valleys. In a microcosm, Glen Gray presented most of the problems found in the recently, if only partially assimilated frontier districts. There was a clear need to remove sources of friction among Africans and between Africans and whites. Mm. Land was at the root of most disputes. 
But to grant individual tenure meant at least the possibility of a flood of newly entitled black voters, conceivably less pressure on Africans to seek work, and a host of ancillary questions with local and capewide budgetary limitations. There also was the danger that whites would purchase the newly saleable black-owned farms and thus thrust vast numbers of landless black families onto the colony. So Rhodes was really worried that white families also would buy up land owned by Africans and move there in the middle of land dominated by Africans. And then you would have communities of white and black people cohabitating, which Rhodes also thought was unacceptable. Because if people are living in the same communities, they're going to fuck eventually. That's just the way humans are, right? That's that's just what's going to (laughs) happen. Like, it just is the thing that happens with people. Um, So he had to find a solution to this problem that achieved a few goals. Number one, it had to steal back most of the land that African tribes held in common. Because mm-hmm. at this point, before the Glen Gray Act, we're talking, we're talking about communally owned land. Yes. It's like this this tribe owns this parcel of land. Yeah. Um, so you have to stop that because communally owned land is not good for the kind of world that Cecil Rhodes wants to build. Um, so you have to get most of that land back on the market somehow. Uh, you also can't make it look like naked theft. And so that means you're going to be parceling at least a lot of this land up and giving it to individual black Africans. But that's a problem because the way the laws in the Cape are crafted, if you own property, you get to vote. So communally owned property doesn't count for that. But if you're going to be giving a bunch of Africans property, suddenly that's a bunch of new voters. And Cecil Rhodes does not want that shit happening. I can't have y'all voting now because, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so he dude uh, the parallel in even in that that like pickle of like yeah after reconstruction and like you know uh and all of a sudden america started electing a ton of black people it was like okay wait a minute we can't Mm -hmm. this well and okay we have to undo this yeah to today a story just dropped today from the Cambridge Analytical leaks, that one of the things they were used for by the Trump administration was to put together a list of between three and five million black Americans that they wanted to and considered it critical to discourage from voting. Oh, my God. Because, again, every couple of generations, you're able to be less naked about the racism. (sighs) But the goal is the same. Stop them from having a say in their own interests. Nailed it. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Since Glenn Gray was representative of so many frontier parts of the colony, it was evident to Cecil that this new law would lay the basis for native and white relations across Africa for the future. This meant, obviously, that the new law would have to be constructed in a way that reinforced white supremacy and enshrined it into South African law forever, no matter what Great Britain's enlightened liberal values said. Cecil told Parliament, the legislature must adopt a system of despotism in its relations with the barbarians of South Africa. The legislature has got to treat the natives where they are in a state of barbarism in a different way to ourselves. We are to be the lords over them. Good guy. Despot. If you're saying we have to be despots, you are the bad guys. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Like, like, like just have just, just, just a smidge of self-awareness. And like, just, yeah, that's all I'm asking. Just, just, just have a lit, just a little self-awareness. It's not good, by and large, to be a despot. That's why we came up with a nasty name for it, like a despot. (laughs) I wish the, I wish the listeners could hear me, see me flail in my arms in agreement, dog. Yeah. The, the, the pretzel peep we bend ourselves in to protect power. There, mm-hmm. There's been a lot of head head nodding, head shaking, arms flailing, yep. and I yeah. do believe yeah. it, sh- it shall continue. Yep. Yes. Speaking of things that shall continue, this episode. So, uh, Rhodes told Good Parliament one. that because of the, yes. the debate over the Glen Gray Act, the colony was in a state of racial emergency with what ballooning the- numbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, because increasing numbers of black Africans were either filling land white people wanted, or even worse, moving to cities that white people lived in. And if you have this population of people, this big underclass who don't have enough money all living in cities, some of them might agitate for better living conditions. And that could lead to a revolution. He was also terrified that if you gave Africans enough land, you know, enough of the land that they already owned, um, they might not get jobs. 
uh-huh. because they'd be able to take care of themselves. And again, yes. they are trying to induct Africa into the global capitalist system at this point. So he's terrified that if they're able to, to see to their own needs in their own uh-huh. land, what need do they have to get involved in this system in which they will fundamentally have to be under us? Dude, when like, just, it's it's, ah, it's such a mind bender because I'm like, okay, we was taking care of ourselves before you got here. Yeah, we All did it for la- a long time. We did it for a long time. <laughs> Matter of fact, longer than any other humans because this is yeah. Africa. So we was here the whole time. And now you worried about us being able to take care of ourselves? Mm-hmm. And it's funny because, again, I I did read some defenses, modern defenses by modern conservatives of Cecil Rhodes. And one thing to point out is that, like, he talked about, you know, he he didn't he wasn't racist. He just believed that, uh, you know, British civilization was superior. And it was. And it'll list, you know, all in all of these tribes that he's conquering and fighting. A lot of them do do the things like female genital mutilation, things that are very horrible um, because all groups of organized human beings do bad things. It's just a thing that people do, period. And, And it's like, yes, it's true. All of those tribes had problems and things that like were were bad that they did and the british empire starved 30 million people to death in order to make a profit so let's not fucking get up on our high horses about the superiority of anglo brit like civil fuckingization like go come on fuck yourself yeah Yeah, basically you're right just you can't say it yeah 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 (laughs) when did they start in when did they start importing the indians to like work because I know oh, like, uh, that, that I think that's a later period it does not later? come okay. up in my research in this maybe it's happening in this period I'm, I'm sorry if I'm I don't want to like make a statement on that one way or the other because it's not my area of expertise okay. um, none of this really is but I, yeah, I at right. least read up on this shit yeah. um, so Cecil claims to parliament that without quote without the dignity of labor Africans would live in sloth and laziness oh it was thus gosh. the government's job to give them some gentle stimulants to go for and find out something of the dignity of labor. Oh my gosh. And he's saying this about the people that have built his entire fortune with their blood, sweat, and tears. Oh my, yes. that that's He's yeah, saying I'm that like, like, the men who dug my diamonds need to understand the dignity of labor. <laughs> yes. You piece of shit. You, you piece absolute of piece of shit. <laughs> like just the largest <laughs> hole in the world that we dug yeah. for you. Telling yeah. me I need to know the dignity of hard labor. <laughs> like, Mother- come on. Oh well, and also God. it's really interesting to me. Yeah. He doesn't consider farming to be labor because it doesn't necessarily feed into capitalism because you can farm and just live comfortably and share and, and trade with your, your neighbors yeah. and not need to be a part of this, uh, this global system of money. Uh, cause you have food and shelter and that's really all you need <laughs> as long as you yeah. are able to make a musical instrument and you've got gourds and shit. You can make drums. Like <laughs> yes. you've got music. You're fine. You got We've music, food fine. and shelter. Fuck it. Yes. Like oh, what else God. do you need? <laughs> oh man. <laughs> Nothing. It turns yeah. out. Yeah. Apparently, apparently his greatest yeah. gift was stress. Cause that's yeah. what we needed. Apparently just mm-hmm. to worry about collecting more things we don't need. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, after months of politicking and debate, Rhodes finally had a plan for this, the Glen Gray Act that he presents to Parliament. The mm-hmm. basics of it were this. Communal lands, these reservations, would be broken up and pieces of them given to black families as individual lots. Now, this had been proposed before by people other than Cecil, and the legislators who had proposed it before wanted to give out one of the individual plots to be about 110 acres, which they thought would be fair, which is not a, a tiny chunk of land. That's big, um, yeah. Rhodes cut the allotments down to eight acres because he wanted it to be impossible for these tiny farms to actually make a profit. He didn't want them to be able to compete with white people's farms, which were much larger and industrial. He also banned partable inheritance, forcing the whole parcel to be passed on intact. This ensured that only the firstborn son of any family would get any land and other children in the family would have to leave the family land to go get jobs. When it was pointed Mm. out to him that white people were able to pass down their property however the fuck they wanted, of course. he replied that giving Africans equal rights, quote, was not a tenable position. Which oh. it's not. If you want the things he wants, you can't be giving black people yeah. equal rights. Yeah. I fucking hate <laughs> He's this not guy. wrong. You know what yeah. the thing? It, it, uh, he's so good at this. He's very good at this. Maybe the best anyone's ever been. He's that exceptional so, at this. He yeah. is exceptional at this thing. 
It is one of those things we do talk about a lot of mediocre white men who failed upwards. He's not mediocre. He's, he's exceptional. Not. He's very he's intelligent. He is actually he, exceptional. Yeah. He yes. knows what he's doing and yeah. he's good at it. And that is a, a, a heartbreaking consequence to the entire history of the human race from this point on. Pretty um, much. So in order to ensure that absolutely every single black person in the colony had to get a job, Rhodes instituted a labor tax of 10 shillings per head for every African, which means oh, you have God. to, we've conquered your country, and now you have to pay every year he to continue existing every, in it. He like, checks every bastardly box. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing how every shitty he is. I'm no longer impressed yeah. by is, the diamonds is, at the party. I by just the way, think he sucks. One of the laws he passes, maybe the most influential, but one of them. He does a bunch of this shit. So the tax meant that no longer could Africans just stay unemployed and live through hunting and farming like the way that people had survived for forever. They couldn't do that anymore. They had to get hard currency somehow. Um, And the landowners that were created by this were included in this. So they couldn't just grow their own food because he didn't think that it was really labor. He wanted everyone to have to engage with capitalism in some way and work. And it's so frustrating. So frustrating because he's so remarkably in charge that like yes yeah there's you have no recourse because he's like he's yeah. freakishly in charge yeah one of the things i think rotberg's a very good biographer one of my issues with him is he will repeatedly talk about sort of cecil's ability to convince people of things as he had this kind of remarkable ability to to convince other men of his vision and he he talks about all of the racist things cecil does but he doesn't lay out in a way that i find as direct as maybe it ought to be and again he wrote it in 1988 but um yeah he doesn't lay out very directly the vision was white supremacy yes. that's why they all <laughs> got on board yes <laughs> like, yeah i am speaking to yeah. the lowest part of you that wants to believe you're better than everybody else yeah it's gonna work so, yeah, uh, again, and again, back to sort of his this tax that he institutes to even force the landowners to work because he doesn't oh. consider growing food to be labor. I'm going to quote from Rotberg here. Rhodes thought that he, he being these small farmers, would spend only three or four weeks sowing maize and would truly not be working hard enough. It would be wise if such a man also went out and worked for a certain period. Uh, now, one of his political <sighs> opponents at the time, another guy in Parliament, commented to this sarcastically, no toil, however strenuous, upon a native's own land would was dignified enough to satisfy the tax collector. So again, there are white guys in politics who recognize how messed up this is and do speak out. You know, he, he's, yeah. he's acknowledging that, like, it doesn't matter how hard they work if it's for themselves. Cecil mm-hmm. wants them working for white people. It's Dude. not that they're not working. It's that they're not yeah. working for you. Yeah. 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 The, so, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to continue the quote. Stimulated by the labor tax, Rhodes the social Darwinist suggested Africans would change for the better. Every black man could not have three acres and a cow in the future, he said. Africans would have to change as a black man could not have three. uh, Africans would have to change as the English had changed. It must be brought home to them that in the future, nine tenths of them must would have to spend their lives in manual labor. And the sooner that was brought home to them, the better. Spend their lives. Yes. So (laughs) now see, some of the supremacy stuff is like you, you. You start being able to follow their train of logic. He is well aware that mm-hmm. Britannica was, at one point, a bunch of feuding tribes mm-hmm. that were just hunter-gatherers with serfdom and feudalism. And we have become this. So then when you look at Africa, you go, oh, yeah, we used to be like that in the 10th century. We're better than you. You know, and just so like, at least it's like you following his logic, at least. And I mean, that's the same. Yeah. That's the proud boy logic of like, no, we used to be like this. We're better now. Yeah. But yeah. No, you're not. No. And a lot of you were miserable because it, it like it, the early industrial age, Victorian England, the cities are fucking nightmares. Yes. With factories like, where children's hands get mangled and coal mines that kill people awful. by the thousands. It's horrible. Yes. Yes. The fucking, the air was unbreathable. It would, they had poisoned their own country and Poise. had left because they wanted to poison other people's countries. Yes. Like, yes. What, what was the, what was the thing? The great London stink? Was that? Yeah, was, yeah, yeah. The stench blossom or whatever that like made the city almost unlivable and killed huge numbers of people. Yeah. Because it was a nightmare there. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, and the yeah. fact that they were able to push their surplus population out to the colonies and also move a lot of their manufacturing and resource extraction yes. out to the colonies is why England's pretty nice nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. Yes. <sighs> so, uh, additionally, Africans would find that they were better off when they went to work. Rhodes promised to spend the funds from the labor tax on industrial schools. Think back to the residential school episodes that we did on Canada, because it's the yeah. same thing. And that the U.S. had, where they put indigenous yeah. people. And that Australia had, where they put indigenous people. Yeah. It is the same thing. Yeah. Where Africans could be caught, taught trades and vocations, not taught yeah. History not taught, you know, to no. uh, not taught to seek their dreams out. Taught how to be functional cogs in capitalism. Uh, Rhodes thought, "quote South Africa had too many schools which specialized in turning out a peculiar class of human beings." The and he uses the K word again, person. Now mm -hmm. the. K word person was a most excellent type of individual, said Rhodes, but he belonged to a class that was overdone. They became agitators what? and accused the government of oppressing the common people. They constituted a dangerous class. You remember that from the police Ooh. episodes we were talking about over here? It's the same wow. motherfucking thing everywhere it happens. Same thing. <laughs> yeah. Yo, I, as a side note, I know people who went to the, the American native schools. Yeah. Jesus. And were, yeah, and told horror stories. That, uh, and it's, yeah, it's just same season. Yeah, kill the Indian to save the man was yeah. the term they used. Yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> yeah, and that's what Rhodes would say. That's and why he's people would say do. he's not racist. Because he's, no, I have nothing against black people. I just want to kill everything about them culturally that is different from the way I want them to live. Yeah. So Rhodes's new law also banned the sale of indigenous land to white people. And this was not for any high minded reason. It was because the natives should be in native reservations and not mixed up with whites. Yeah. Keep them, this, keep them away. Yeah. This is the start of apartheid. Yeah. This is the birth of segregation, yeah. legal segregation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You yeah. have a it's, place to be and it's not near us. Yeah. Yep. It's cool as long as they over there. Yeah. So again, so the and finally, after all that, the Glenn Gray Act ins ensured that all of these new landowning black people would not get the right to vote as enshrined by the law. As he told Parliament, it was really ridiculous to suppose that these poor children could be taken out of this absolute barbarism and come to a practical conclusion on politics. <laughs> so the act very simply banned any native enfranchised by the Glenn Gray bill from voting in Cape elections. Rhodes wow. justified this again by saying that because the government protected their land, they had no real right to, right to vote on it. Black people could not be citizens as they were children. Cecil oh. Rhodes! Dude, again, the, the, he wove a story, this is, bro. Yeah, this is why I'm saying he took went a place that had been caught like that was African land conquered and dominated by white people, and he made it worse and more racist. This is where apartheid comes from. This is yes. the legal underpinning that all apartheid descends from. Is the shit Cecil Rhodes was making happen in this period, and it lasts up until what, like the late '80s, the fucking early '90s, like '91. Yeah, 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 yeah. Masterful. Um, I've, and it's year, still like the impacts are still seen. Sure. It's still yeah. if you yeah. yeah every year, like I said, like I perform there at least yeah. once a year. I got a homeboy on the radio in Cape Town. My homeboy DJ Easy and. He's he's what they called colored under the system, mm -hmm. right? So we driving through Cape Town, one of the uh, like this is the most beautiful like <laughs> overlooking cliffs, beach, like it's a paradise. And he goes, "Yo, my dad used to work at this beach, but at sundown he had to leave because coloreds weren't allowed on this beach." And I'm like, "Yo, you used yep. to?" I'm like, "That's your father, bro? Like that's mm -hmm. this." This, it's now, you know what I'm saying? He talked about like people, you know, the police will come in and stick a pencil in his hair to make sure, because if the pencil falls, yeah. then that means he's black and not colored yeah. and just all kinds of just like, this is like, he's yeah. on, he's a DJ. He's on the radio now. This is now. Yeah. That's yeah. why Trevor Noah's biography is titled like Born a Crime, right? Like, yeah. Because he was, he was, his, his, like, one of his he's, parents was white and one was, was, yeah, was colored. black. And yeah, yeah. that was Ill colored. And that's, yeah, that's illegal. And yeah. it's illegal. Like Cecil Rhodes is the guy who it's not quite banned in this period, but he's the guy yeah. who starts that process. He starts all that's, that. Why he part of his goal in this act was to make sure these people can't breed because if they breed, then they stop hating each other, right? Yes. If people are falling in love, they don't want lesser rights for the people they're in love with, and that's going to be a fucking problem for me, Cecil Rhodes. Yes. <laughs> so you have to stop them from knowing each other. Speaking of knowing each other, get to know the fine products and services that support this podcast. All right. 
Ah, uh, we're back. Oh we're my back. gosh, so good products. Dude. So the this this the one of the this is the greatest like white supremacist finesse. And it, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, it's uh, now, incredible. The Glenn Gray Act did create something broadly analogous to local councils for these native reservations so that they could have an element of self-government. But even letting black people vote for their own local leaders was too much for Cecil. Instead, yeah. white people appointed all of the council members <gasps> and the reservations were governed by a white magistrate. He was supposed to teach them how to take care of themselves. Yeah. Yo. Yeah, it's that, that's the answer. They're children. You see. Yep. Yeah. Which is so such a... Ah, God damn, it's and such a you, unique version of white supremacy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ex and Rhodes is, again, other people are having this idea. You can even probably find some people earlier who were talking about it. Rhodes is kind of the first who explains it to other white people in a way that gets them on board and then follows through in a really comprehensive fashion. And again, yeah. aspects of this are, ha are happening in the United States at the time. Uh, mm -hmm. Aspects of this are happening in other parts of the world. So he's not yeah. alone, but he's part of the first wave of yeah. modern white supremacists. And in some ways, yeah. he's probably the one who did the best job of defining and explaining it. Yeah. So, uh, Rotberg wow. writes, quote, the Glenn Gray bill was a forerunner of the segregationist legislation of the 20th century and of the combination of laws which together constitute apartheid. But it was not so much the content of the bill as it was Rhodes's rhetoric and rationalizations with, which prefigured the future. What modern readers appreciate as fatuous and solipsistic arguments, mere fig leaves for white supremacy and denials of African rights, were those that Rhodes and all subsequent rulers in South Africa have used to justify their departures from the natural law and political culture of the Western world. It is a testimony to Rhodes' force of character and quality of persuasion that he, alone of likely Cape leaders, was able to arrange sh such shifts away from previous norms with ease. It delineates his character, too, that he did so with equanimity, without shame, and with self-righteous determination. God, dog, when you, when you swear you're right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I can't, yeah. I, can't, I can't believe how long it lasts. Yeah. Damn. Yep. He, yeah. And he I'm like, bro, like, fucking ever. Like, dude, you own two other countries, man. Like, why mm -hmm. you gotta? Why don't you just why go you to do this? you own, man? Like, why you gotta do this way down? They, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's it's because it's not enough. It's because the it's world is what he wants. Oh, I yeah. forgot because the first because this is like manifest destiny only the globe. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And again, he's the kind of white person who like is angry because uh, Americans are independent and they fill the like he talks a lot about the how the inferior Italian and Irish races and stuff are dominating and Germans are dominating in America. And that's why yeah. it should have stayed under Anglo control. So he's like he's the kind of racist who is, is sees shades of other white people and like yeah. is judgmental. And it's like, oh, I, Italians. Are, it's like if you if you look at. If you look at Nazi propaganda, the degree mm -hmm. to which I do, one of the joking things that they will do is talk about how the Axis was less racist than the Allies because Hitler had a black friend. And when they refer to that, oh, Hitler's they're talking about friend, Mussolini, right? Yeah, they're talking about Mussolini because Italians yeah. aren't white to them. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> and I felt so like, like knowing that, like once I, yeah, once I learned that, like I had to take back some of my own jokes because I used to feel like, yeah, Italians were the the black white people too. I'm like, yeah. Big I mean, they're they're like they're they're definitely like close. To, I mean, it's basically they're almost in the Middle East, right? Like it's right across totally. that fucking sea. It's, yeah, yeah, but yes, yeah. That's yeah, what racists are seeing. But yeah. that's what roast. So I'm like, dang, I can't agree with racist crap. No, 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 no. Because I'm saying it endearing. Like, I'm no. like, oh man, I like y'all got big families, y'all loud, y'all gangsters, y'all yeah. said, yeah. Uh, yeah. food's the, great, the, yeah. The, the the things we should we should lovingly make fun of Italians for is all of the hand gestures that we do and yeah. and, and and pizza pies. Yeah. Uh, that's fine. Don't the pizza don't pies. don't do the racist. Uh, pizza pies, yeah. The pizza pies. I'm pizza not gonna pies. do any sort of. No, I will though, but not okay. here. I think okay. it's funny. Yeah. It's fine. So uh, Cecil yeah. Rhodes invented apartheid. And, and the, the only good news is that he didn't get a lot more time in the sun after this. After mm. a very long stream of successes, Rhodes got cocky. And he decided to deal with a problem that had vexed him for years. Ooh, the nice. existence of the Transvaal, which is this Boer state. It becomes like, yeah, it, it, it's it's a, a big chunk of like what becomes the culture of South Africa. These are like yeah. the Afrikaners. The Afrikaners, and it, okay. Yeah, and, and, and the Transvaal is an independent white nation in South Africa. And it, 
this the fact that it existed fucked up his dream of unifying the whole region under British control. Uh-huh. So in true Cecil Rhodes fashion, he hatched a plan to steal the Transvaal. The basic idea was to disguise it as an insurrection. Johannesburg had a sizable population of British laborers, and they were not content with the Boer government. Through his agent, Leander Jameson, Rhodes convinced these folks that if they recruited an army, he would send in his own army, and together they could crush the Boers. And army's the wrong word for Rhodes' force here. He had Mm -hmm. 600 policemen (laughs) armed with field artillery and machine guns and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, he did. All paid for by De Beers. Of course. So, uh, yeah, uh, it, the invasion, the Jameson raid, as it's called, was a shit show from the jump. The British mm. expats couldn't agree on what they wanted politically after the insurrection. And because they had such a disagreement about this, they asked Jameson to pause the raid because they weren't ready. And he said, yeah. fuck you, I'm going to invade anyway. And his hope was that this would spur them to act. But instead, yeah. it just meant that nobody, none of his allies were ready when he invaded a sovereign nation. Um, and then his troops were trying to cut the telegraph wires to the capital capitals that no one would know they were coming, but they cut a fence instead of the telegraph wires, <laughs> which let the Boers organize a defense. Jameson's police were ambushed and a lot of them were shot to death until they surrendered. Now, the whole Jameson raid was an unaccountable political disaster. It blackened Cecil's name for the rest of his life. It forced yes. him out as prime minister. It sparked the end of his political career. He did try to come yes. back a few times. He had friends write defenses of him and stuff the, uh, a couple of years later, but it didn't work. He um, got old timey and- canceled. Yeah. He earned it. He you did get saying? canceled for yeah. invading a white nation. Yeah. Yeah. Like, look. For doing now, what you, he'd been doing. Yeah. yeah. Let me teach you a little thing about white people. Yeah. White people don't stand for being challenged, yeah. even by other white people. Let me tell you something, brother. You should have slowed down, Icarus. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it, it is one of those things you can see is just covering the Portland kind of uprising or whatever you want to call it as I have yeah. and watching my friends co- cover it. You do tend to see a big difference when like a black activist gets knocked down as mm-hmm. opposed to when a white person who's not an activist yeah. gets knocked down. You see a diff- you see just a clear difference in like the number of views that that video yeah. gets. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's just like it, it, nobody's, it's yeah. not even a conscious thing. It's just no. a thing. It's crazy um, to me too. Like, it just uh, this when you like I the one thing I tell any artist or anybody like trying to start a business or anything like the value of taking an L, like the value of a mm-hmm. loss. Like, if you never lose, if everything you step into, you just all you do is win, then you it will inevit that L is coming. It's coming, boy. And if you keep stacking and, and, and just and just and just doubling down because you don't never lose, you don't never lose, you don't never when that L comes, it is going to be ginormous. So mm-hmm. I'm like, look, look, man, just be 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 a be aware, be always cautious to somebody that don't ever lose. Cause it's yeah. coming. Yeah. Yeah. Stay away from those people. Yeah. So the whole Jameson raid, again, just a horrible political disaster. Black and Cecil's name ends his political career. It also played a key role in sparking the second Boer War, which is the Boer War that everybody hears about. This led okay. to the first modern use of concentration camps by the British Empire against the Boer people and against black Africans who lived in Boer territory. Wow. Uh, 30,000 soldiers died, 26,000 Boer civilians were starved to death, and 20,000 African natives were starved to death in British concentration camps. Thanks in part to Cecil. So, that war ended in 1902, and so did Cecil Rhodes. He was only oh. 49 years old, but he packed centuries of being a piece of shit into his life, and he was ready <laughs> no, to go. No, effic- uh, efficient bastard. He was 49, yeah. that's it? 49. And he always knew he was going to die young. He has his first you heart attack to. in, like, 1872. Like, yeah. So he's throwing everything he can into being garbage. Um, now, at the time he died, he was a rather marginalized figure within the British Empire. The Times wrote in his obituary, he has done more than any single contemporary to place before our imagination, before the imagination of his countrymen, a clear conception of the imperial destinies of our race. But we wish we could forget the other matters associated with his name. <laughs> that is the yeah. most British answer. I know he did yeah. a lot of whack stuff. I mean, but he was really good. But let's not talk about all the bad stuff. Yeah, let's not talk about all it that got kind of weird. Yeah. It kind Kind of, kind of weird for a little bit, but he was yeah. great. <laughs> then he died, thank God. So he doesn't yes. get to fuck up anymore. 
Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So the good news for Rhodes is that a number of people have forgotten all the other matters associated with his name today, and he's increasingly being praised as a hero on the right wing. Uh, He was the absolute archetype of a white supremacist imperialist. He stated at one point late in his life that I would annex the planets if I could. And if you read all like the full quote, he seems really sad that he can't annex the planets like (laughs) this this guy's ready for space imperialism. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah. we're almost there now. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're to, working on it. We're working yeah. on Annex and Mars right now. Yeah, yeah. God and we'll dog, find man. a way. There, there's not native people on Mars, but we'll find a way to fuck to fuck them up. We'll we're, make we'll make an indigenous Martian population and then screw them over. We will <laughs> we will fight wars over something that come out the ground in Mars. Mm-hmm. And Darn just, right we will. Yes, we're totally gonna do it. We're gonna draw an imaginary line on a planet. And yeah. be like, this side's ours. Let's be angry about it forever. Let's yeah. be angry forever. God, what is so yeah. freaking species, man? I Dang. had to read, I couldn't end this without talking about some defenses of Cecil Rhodes. So I found one published back in 2016, not okay. coincidentally, by Standpoint Magazine. Now, a sizable chunk of their defense is related to probably the most prominently uh, uh, the quote most regularly attributed to Cecil Rhodes I prefer land to in words now Cecil did not say this exact quote it's actually kind of people merging two things he said including like you remember that quote I said earlier that he wants to annex land not natives Mm -hmm. he said this he just didn't say it exactly that way and he said the n-word a lot constantly he just didn't say it exactly that way so it's not much of a defense that he said something slightly different, but meant the same thing in my fucking book. Now, yeah, yeah, again. In the right book. Yeah. The defenses get funnier and funnier from there on out, and I'm going to read one. Besides Rhodes' besides Rhodes's early, arguably racist reference... <laughs> Yes, arguably racist that the Anglo-Saxon race is superior to all other races and should rule them. Arguably racist. You could argue that. Maybe. I might debate that. Yeah. It's debatable. But <laughs> but they say this has to be on. weighed against all the other things he said and did. From first to last, he had a record of good relations with individual Africans. His primary biographer, Robert Rotberg, who is generally oh. critical of the subject, writes that as a young man, he had related directly and well to unlettered Zulu. Throughout his life, he remained sympathetic and responsive to the needs of individual persons of color. Not oh, your man. stereotypical racist, then. To which oh. I say, yes, your stereotypical motherfucking yes. racist. Yes. And this is going to bring me. Yeah. You yeah. have black friends. I can't be racist. I- yeah. My son has a black friend. <laughs> this is going to bring me to, do you know who Louis Theroux is? No. He's a, he's a British documentarian, a very, very popular one, and I, I, I quite like a lot of his work. In the 90s, the late 90s, he did a series called Weird Weekends, where he would go spend time in mostly, I think, American subculture. So he spent a lot of time with Nazis, uh, okay. and one of the Nazis he hung out with is a guy named Tom Metzger. Now, Tom Metzger was the head of a group called White Aryan Resistance, or WAR. He was the guy, okay. if you're an Oregonian, whose, whose members were responsible for the murder of Mulu Gedesura in Portland, Got which it. is like yeah. one of the kind of big yeah a very important yeah. thing to understand he is one of the most famous racists there's ever been tom metzger yeah, yeah. in the documentary where louis spends several days just kind of living with him to get an understanding for the guy's personality he notices that tom has a, a mexican-american neighbor and is friendly with him and they'll like help each other out and stuff and yeah. Uh, uh, Tom differentiates between this individual person who he knows and thinks is okay and Mexicans in general with whom he had nothing but like racist yeah. bile. Yeah, the and it's concept the same thing of Mexican. The same thing for the Nazis. If you read internal Nazi discussions as they were planning the Holocaust, one of the problems for them was that in kind of the terms they would use is everyone has their own their own like favored Jew that they think is different from the other Jews. And that's why we have to develop a legal code to oppress these people because otherwise individuals will be slipping through the cracks. Even Hitler even Adolf yeah. Hitler rescued one Jew from the Holocaust that he orchestrated, the doctor who had tried to save his mother when he was a child. He got Sheesh. that guy out of the country because he knew what he was about to do. So, yes, it is stereotypically racist yes, to it's, be it's nice like, to individual people who are of the races you hate. Ah. <laughs> uh, uh, it makes exhausting. racism even, it makes, it makes yeah. it more exhausting and that much more stupid. Because it's yeah. like, oh, you hate a concept. 
Yeah, that's you know, exactly it. You hate a concept. Yeah, and the the proof that your concept is wrong is that there are individual people who are part of this concept of yours that you are able to like and get along with because they're people, and so are you. Like, it just yeah, yeah. Like, at what point do you get tired of being on the wrong side of history? Yeah, at the point it at just, which I don't know. I don't know, man. Yeah. Well, I can't I'm, get it emotionally. Yeah. So. To continue, this conservative writer of this very bad article, um, I, I, I think it's funny that he uses this argument, that he argues that, like, well, he was nice to individual Africans, because this argument that he made to defend uh, this guy in 2016 is the same that Leander Jameson used to defend Rhodes from charges of cruelty to natives in 1897. So after Rhodes yeah. has his disastrous raid, he's trying to do a comeback tour, his friends defend him. They use the same defense, which is that he's nice to individual Africans. Uh, Leander Jameson noted, quote, his favorite Sunday pastime was to go to the De Beers' native compound... <laughs> where he segregated them away from the white workers, where he had built them a fine swimming pool and Ooh, throw wee. in shillings for the natives to dive for. Oh, man, just the white nonsense, boy. Yeah. Ooh, he was. He is, loved them. He threw money at them. <laughs> this is nonsense. Yeah. Man, how you say this with a straight face? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the article is very long and a lot of it's funny. I'm just going to yeah. read one more quote Give trying to more. justify Cecil's bigotry. And again, this is from that article. Yes, Rhodes thought that black Africans were generally inferior, but in terms of cultural development, not biology, he believed they could become civilized. Oh. This is important because if one regards a people as biologically inferior and incapable of development, then that's a reason to exclude them permanently from participation in their own government. But that wasn't how Rhodes saw things. In a speech of 1894, he made this quite clear when he said, now I say the natives are children. They are just emerging from barbarism. They have human yeah. minds. We ought to do something for the minds and the brains that the Almighty has given them. I do not yeah. believe that they are different from ourselves. But mm. you acted that way and enshrined a Except set of laws that lasted a century after your death, enshrining yeah. those differences. Yeah. <laughs> I don't believe they're any different than us, except that yeah. you absolutely believe they're different than you. Yeah. They're, when you're, <laughs> as a white person, when you're when you're trying to justify, when you're trying to talk about and like equivocate on racism, you should think about whether or not you would be comfortable saying that to the face of a person of that race. So yeah. would you, what would, what do you, like, how would you feel walking up to a black person and saying, I'm not racist or this guy wasn't racist. He just thought that your entire race was children. Like, yeah. How, do you, would you, would you feel fundamentally guilty saying that? Would you feel too ashamed to say that? Yeah. Then perhaps it's racist as fuck. <laughs> yeah. Coming out of your mouth. That didn't yeah. sound like you didn't hear yourself. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No. So uh, at the end of this, I, like, I want to tell me spend I a little bit of time, yet. <laughs> not quite yet, because we need Damn to it. grapple with the last part of Cecil's legacy. The thing that okay. he left us that continues to kill people every year, the blood diamond trade. Oh, now, no. again, by 1888, he had basically complete monopolistic troll control over the diamond market. He made a monopoly. He formed a cartel called the London Diamond Syndicate, which were all of the biggest people actually selling diamonds to consumers. And yeah. this allowed him to match supply with demand artificially and mm -hmm. keep and keep value high even though there were actually a shitload of extra diamonds. Yeah, they're um, everywhere. <laughs> yeah, they're fucking everywhere. They're not yeah. precious. Yeah. Um, so this provided, like, yeah, is, so he, he builds this thing, and it becomes the model of the diamond industry for forever. Um, his descendants, the people who take over De Beers after him, um, follow in his footsteps and continue to maintain a monopoly using these same tactics, controlling 90 plus percent of the global diamond market. Uh, in the 1930s, the people who follow after Cecil Rhodes and De Beers start the mining campaign, Diamonds Are Forever in the United oh, States. Oh, um, yeah. or sorry, 1947 is when that starts. Yeah. Uh, 1939 is when they start marketing diamonds to the middle class because they had been like a rich person thing. And they start trying to get, get across everyone needs a diamond to show that you love your spouse. Diamonds yes. Are Forever starts in 1939. 1947 and De Beers becomes an even bigger marketing empire than it had already been. Um, so there they die for what we buy from drugs. That's a kind yeah. of reference. Old and Kanye. it's, 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 <laughs> it's, yeah. So they, they, they just, they expand demand and they also create a permanent, mm. 
they create a permanent market for diamonds in Africa, and yeah. it's not a good market. Um, in 1935, no. De Beers takes complete control of mining prospects in Sierra Leone, and their contract gives them control for 99 years. Now, this opens up a black market, uh, and Lebanese traders in Sierra Leone discover that you can make a lot of money by smuggling diamonds out of the country. Illicit mining and training increased throughout Sierra Leone. By the 1950s, the government had given up any chance of policing the diamond industry. Foreign investors had to supply their own security, which was done generally by mercenary forces. Uh, and yeah, so these uh, by creating this very, very valuable legitimate diamond trade that the government doesn't control, you also yeah. create an illegitimate diamond trade that the government doesn't control. And that yeah. provides a way for insurgent militaries to fund themselves. And this yes. is what starts happening all over Africa in this yes. period of time. You have these massive wars over di over minerals, wars funded by minerals, it, with diamonds chief among them. And it's 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 a nightmare every single place that it happens. Uh, in Sierra mm. Leone, they're fucking cutting off hands. That's um, what I was going to say. It's just armless yeah. kids. Yeah. Yeah. They kill 75,000 people. Half a million people become refugees. And that's not the worst that it gets. Um have you, you you've heard about the the Great African War? I think it starts yes. in 1998. Uh, some people yes. like, and, and, and it's the biggest war after World War Three. It's the yeah. biggest war we've had since almost no one in 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 the Western world has has ever heard about it. It's also yeah. sometimes called the Congo War. Mm. Um, it happens in the late 90s. It kills five million people. Yes. And it is a war over minerals, over gold, diamonds, tin, ivory, and coltan, which I think is used to help make computers. Yeah. Um, and it's it's one of those wars where there's like millions of people who are raped systematically in like an industrial fashion. You have millions more who die from lack of medical care. Um, and again, it, the war is able to continue on because rebels are or because these different sides are able to take control of diamonds and mine diamonds and sell them for guns to commit these massacres. Yeah. And a lot of other what part of the reason where I'm not going into much detail about this here is that a lot of other people, of course, are half involved in this. Like Cecil Rhodes is Medetta while he starts the chain of events that makes the yeah. great African war and the Sierra Leone, everything that's happening in all of yeah. these countries over diamonds, over, con over, over conflict minerals. Con yeah. He's the origin point. Yeah. I know if you're into hip hop, you've heard the phrase conflict diamonds. And yeah. This is what we're talking about. If you don't know. And yeah. Yeah. And it's like, it's the, uh, among the, at least, at least in my opinion, among the African American community, this is the, the cognitive dissonance that we have to deal with of like our hand in upholding this like diamond trade. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. what if we as a culture, as American culture, who we love to shine, I get it. But if we decided like, yo, we're not touching diamonds anymore. You know what I'm saying? In, in solidarity to our African brothers and sisters. It's something I feel like we need to at some point reckon with, you know, um, but yeah, yeah, it's 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 a hard topic, man. And that then and I made a reference to a Kanye song from yeah. the college dropout album, which or not from the late registration album called Diamonds Are Forever or Conflict Diamonds. Yeah, and it's it's um you know, one of the things I guess I can say to that is Cecil's goal was to kill the culture the Africans live under and make them all yeah. live under the rules and culture that that Anglo Americans did. Yeah. And the Great African War is some evidence that he succeeded to an extent. Yeah. Because yeah. what he did, leading in mercenary armies to take over mining areas in order to extract minerals and using that to fund the conquests of more of these mercenaries, is yeah. exactly what all these wars it's are. It's what happened. Yes. It's what happened. He succeeded. Yeah. They adopted that part of British culture. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you for... Ex Thanks for that, know. buddy. Ex, you know, exporting Western <laughs> culture. We're now mutilating each other. Yeah, for more information rocks. on the topic, uh, see the yeah. Warren Zevon song, Rollin' the Headless Thompson Gunner. Um, yes. <laughs> so, yes. Prop, uh, you, you got some plugs to plug in now the Now I can zone. plug my plugs. Yeah, let's do it. Great. Uh, capitalism. Um, mm -hmm. Well, I'm selling music and coffee, uh, but it's just prophiphop.com. And that's all my ad mentions too. And it just all feels so trivial. Um, on the other hand, my children like to eat. So 
yeah, check out the music. Yeah. Check out the poetry. I got a coffee collab coming up. Uh, what's up up now? Um, where this is ethically sourced. I feel like it's important to say it mm-hmm. now. A uh, company called Onyx who pays 500% higher than market price because we believe in farmers and supporting. And, yeah. And it's a good drink. Yeah. And I'm finishing an album. And Excellent. at some point, I'll give that links to that. Yeah. Hell yes. Hell yes. Well, check all that out. Check me out somewhere on the internet. No one's quite sure where. Um, and that's all. Scholars, that's everything. Well, a lot of people do because I've seen your followers grow. But, you know, okay. So. Well, yeah. I'm not yeah, even going to plug your people. pluggables for you, Robert. Thank you, Sophie. Mm-hmm. Thank I will. You. I'll plug it for you. You could find him at I Write OK, I think. Allegedly. Allegedly. Cannot confirm and or deny. Mm-hmm. Cannot confirm or deny that I write okayness. <laughs> yeah. And you write better than okay, man. You're a great writer. Oh, thank you. Uh, it was actually like I, I think I, I it was. It's very unclear because I'm uh, 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 w- w- wasn't always as good at writing as I am now. Of My course. meaning was that was not that I write okay. It was like it came from. Uh, like years of frustration of explaining what I did for a living because oh. I had a bunch of different weird freelance jobs Comma. with different online uh, yeah like I write okay yeah like, yeah, yeah that, that, was, that, that was why punctuation, yeah. punctuation matters mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> alrighty alright guys products wait shit no probably that's, that's capitalism for you could be alright